People are the most consequential and dangerous forces on Earth. Well, personality psychology is about the nature of human nature. It's about people. And wouldn't that be useful to know? I mean, it seems to me, I can't, I can't think of a more important problem. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Blake Lutt, PR manager at Hogan Assessments and co-host of the Science of Personality podcast. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today for the first edition of the Science of Personality Live. For those of you who don't know, Hogan has a bi-weekly podcast called The Science of Personality, where we bring in guests who are leaders in their field to talk about personality and the various ways it impacts our lives. We're very excited to bring that to you live today with our topic, What's Driving the Big Quit? A look at personality in the workplace. We want today's session to be engaging and interactive, so we'd love to hear what questions you may have for us. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the discussion, so if you want to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. It can be a little difficult for us to keep track of the questions coming in via the chat feature, so please be sure to use the Q&A feature if you'd like to see your question answered. Uh, lastly, we are recording today's discussion and it will be made available on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Hogan Assessments. And if you're interested in viewing past webinars uh, or see what's coming up with uh, what's going on at Hogan Assessments, you can visit our webinars page at hoganassessments.com slash webinars. So with that out of the way, let's get started with the brief introduction of today's guest. First, I'd like to introduce my co-host on the Science of Personality podcast, and Hogan's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Ryan Sherman. As Hogan's Chief Science Officer, Ryan is responsible for managing the primary functions within Hogan's industry-leading data science team, including client research, product development and infrastructure, and overseeing Hogan's research archive and infrastructure. So with that, Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself to the guests? <laughs> well, uh, look, I want to say thanks to everybody for being here today. Good to see you, Blake. Uh, we usually do this podcast without any video at all, so it's, it's nice to know uh, that you actually have to wear a shirt today. Yeah, well, you know, um, you, you kind of get comfortable whenever you don't have any video on. So today I decided to, <laughs> to comb my hair and put on a shirt. So <laughs> with that, next I'd like to introduce Hogan CEO, Dr. Scott Gregory. As CEO, Scott brings years of expertise in executive selection, development, and succession planning to his leadership and vision for all aspects of Hogan's domestic and global business. Also, fun fact, Scott was one of the first employees at Hogan, completing his PhD under Bob and Joyce Hogan, the firm's founders. So with that, let's dive into the first edition of the Science of Personality Live. So Scott, do you have anything you'd like to, to say to the audience before we get started? Well, two quick things, and maybe three. One, uh, thanks to you and Ryan for having me on again. And uh, it's always fun to chat with you guys. And I always enjoy the, uh, the uh, audience participation. So thanks everybody for joining us. And we look forward to the questions. Um, two, I, I don't know if you've looked at the Q&A, but the first comment was uh, praising your hairdo. So I just want to second that, that a great hairdo. And, um, well, and not third, mine. no, not you, Ryan. Oh. And, but, <laughs> but Ryan, I do have, I heard something the other day that I wanted to ask you about and just, you know, right off the top, I think it's important. And that is that uh, I, I heard, I, it's true, not true, I don't know, but I heard that you once caused a real stir among a uh, university uh, research ethics board review board uh, for trying to transplant the average personality of an undergraduate into a yak. And uh, <laughs> what I heard was it was concerned about cruelty to animals or something. I don't, do you want to clear that up before we well, dive into this? You know, those ethics committees can be pretty stringent in uh, their, their requirements. Uh, you know, one nice thing about getting out of the uh, academic world is that, you know, I I'm not so restricted in our research uh, by those ethics committees. So, um, you know, I don't want to spoil too much, but, the, but those of us who regularly follow Hogan assessments might want to look forward to our yak personality assessment uh, coming down the road. YPA. Yes. You know, Ryan, as, as the, the resident public relations uh, guy at Hogan, um, I would kind of like to be made aware of these things um, so that we can... <laughs> So that we can maybe uh, 
mitigate any issues in the future. But I digress <laughs> with that. Let's move into what everybody's here to uh, to see and, and hear you all talk about today. So, you know, I think one of the top headlines over the past couple of years is that employees are quitting their jobs in staggering numbers. So, you know, Scott, my first question goes to you. What is causing this mass exodus? You know, and what is driving people to quit their jobs? Yeah, well, it is the, the question of the moment for sure. And, um, you know, the big quit, the big resignation, uh, as it's called, um, is actually a continuation of a trend that's been going on for for uh, a little over 10 years. And um, with the exception of 2020, it has been increasing, that is turnover has been increasing uh, year after year. And there was a little dip, fairly substantial dip in 2020, I think while we all tried to get our bearings, but then it ramped up again in 2021. So it's, I'm not saying that to dismiss the problem, it is a real problem. It's not a new problem but it's a big problem. And, um, and it's certainly true that stress, uh, working remotely, all the changes we've been through have uh, exacerbated this trend mm -hmm. to some extent. But it's also true that uh, for many decades, um, a majority of working adults have said uh, over and over in research studies that the worst, most stressful part of their jobs was their immediate manager. And, um, and, you know, and we've all heard the, the phrase, which is true, that uh, people often leave their managers rather than their companies. And so, you know, I think that that is a key force driving a lot of this turnover, because now we have a situation where there are more jobs than there are people to fill them. So there's lots of opportunity. Uh, we've had this moment of deep reflection many times about what we're doing and where we do it and how we do it. And so uh, uh, people are looking at their options and some of them are voting uh, about their bad managers uh, with their feet. So uh, I think that's a big part of the trend. It's a sort of a great rethink uh, as well as a, a great resignation. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Scott. And I think the you know, that point about managers is a, is a, is a really good one. And, and, and it also points to this fact that you mentioned as well, that this is really just a continuation of a trend. You know, there was this dip uh, during, you know, when COVID started, look, a lot of employers, unfortunately, uh, had to lay off employees. Um, and so I think a lot of, a, a lot of employees felt like they were just, it was, you know, they really wanted to cling on to their job for another year. It wasn't really a good time to look for another job. Um, and then, as that things have as things have sort of settled out from that, uh, we see this uh, people who are who are sort of waiting to leave, partly because of a bad manager, uh, saying now okay I'm going to get out of here right. So I think that that's one of the big the big drivers, and, and other folks have talked about that. One of the things that we've seen people talk about it, and I will drop these into the chat here at some point, is is um, some research that was. Uh, recently published, uh, I think the first article was out in January, or February, the most recent one was last month on toxic culture, and how toxic culture is one of the things that is driving um, this, this sort of great resignation or the big quit or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is based on a, a bunch of glass door reviews. So um, these are researchers who uh, use some software to basically codify lots and lots of glass door reviews categorize those into themes, say, okay, this is the theme of this review, this is the things that they're talking about. And they basically can create a score for toxicity, they can create scores for all kinds of issues um, for every um, er every organization that's that has enough reviews on Glassdoor, which are lots of them. And using those scores, they basically said that the number one driver, and this is a part that I think surprised a lot of people. So you might be thinking, um, Oh, is it uh, is it pay right? It, it is you know okay? Well, there's inflation, and maybe people wanted to get paid more, or is it um, you know remote work policies, or is it how they've handled COVID? Uh, and it seems to be the number one cause, three times, almost three times greater than the number two cause, seems to be workplace toxicity or or a toxic culture. And I know a little later on, we'll, we'll probably get into what what that actually consists of, but um, I, I think at the end of the day, that's all driven by leadership, as you mentioned, Scott. Well, okay, so this is this is a great start and a great way to kick this off. Uh, I guess for my next question, um, you know, a couple of there are a couple of things that you know we've we've seen, you know, as I was actually researching for this particular uh, 
first edition of the Science of Personality Live is that, um, you know, two things, empowerment and burnout seem to be two of the primary drivers of what's, what's causing people to quit their job in these, again, staggering numbers. So based on what we know about personality in previous research, it seems that two of the a big five dimensions being extroversion and conscientiousness are linked to these feelings of empowerment. So why is that? Yeah, so I'll start here. Um, the extroversion factor, you know, we, we actually split that into two parts. One is we call ambition, one we call sociability. But if you think about the, the extroversion factor and particularly the ambition part of it in the big five, um, it's, it's associated with uh, people being described as having strong self-confidence, being competitive, being uh, uh, comfortable taking charge, uh, providing guidance to others, uh, having a sort of clear sense of mission. So these are people who, who have a strong sense of agency and they simply assume empowerment uh, often. One of my colleagues used to say, these are people who cannot not lead. Uh, that is, these are just people who naturally feel a sense of empowerment. The same is true for a different reason for people who are high on conscientiousness. Um, you know, they are often described as people who are very organized, they're self-disciplined, they're process focused, they're planners. And so they also have uh, often just have an inherent strong sense of agency because they have a plan and they're going to work their plan and they don't need a lot of guidance and, and structure because they create it for themselves. So I think both of those personality characteristics and the agency behind them really leads to uh, people who are high on both feeling a, a natural sense of empowerment. Yeah, and I think related to, the, to these concepts are, you know, and I think this actually came from Bob Hogan. I think he was the first person I ever heard talk about this which is that people are only going to remain in any kind of a relationship, whether that's a work relationship or whether that's a romantic relationship or a business partnership. They're only going to remain in that so long as they feel like they're getting a good deal. So long as they feel like, hey, this is a fair trade, right? I'm giving you something. You're giving me something. We're both, we're both happy with this deal. So we, we remain in this, in this relationship. And part of the deal with the, with the, the big quit or the great resignation is that clearly um, lots of workers feel like they're not getting a good deal. Um, now, part of that issue is, uh, is do you feel like you can get a better deal elsewhere, right? And so I think that that's part of it as well, right? So we know that there are lots of employers trying to hire. There's lots of competition for talent right now. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of a simple uh, supply and demand kind of issue uh, in some respects as well. So uh, employees clearly feel that empowerment because there are lots of opportunities out there for them. And so that means that, that, uh, that uh, these organizations really do have to compete for that talent. Um, in, ter in terms of thinking about burnout, Blake, which you mentioned there, I think one of the, the, the big things there is we know that there's um, personality correlates of burnout, right? Like Scott mentioned some. Uh, there's also sort of personality correlates about being sort of um, resilient to burnout as well, right? So like how, how resilient to stress am I? Uh, and, you know, there, it's, it's a little bit of a tricky situation because sometimes companies will ask us to do, to, you know, to help us find employees who aren't going to burn out, right? Help us find employees who aren't going to turn over. And on the one hand, there are certain personality characteristics that are related to that. But on the other hand, we're not really wanting to put people in a situation where very few people are going to be happy anyway, right? So, you know, one example, we had a client, and I actually don't remember the client's name, so that's nice for the story, um, uh, that, that wanted, that had a really kind of a crappy job. It was a really hard job, right? You had to do a whole lot of stuff. It was like 60 hours a week and with very little pay. And they said, well, can you help us with our turnover problem? And the answer was, well, I mean, we can help you try to hire people who are less likely to turn over, but I think if you want to fix your turnover problem, it's right in front of you. This isn't a very fun job to do. And that's what we're seeing with, with people in terms of this kind of empowerment that we're talking about. I said, I'm burnt out on this. I'm overworked on this. I feel like this is a bad deal for me. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, you know, you mentioned the just individual differences. We know 
before the pandemic, there are some people who are chronically stressed. They, 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 it's very consistent for them or stress prone. So they respond very emotionally uh, to, to unexpected events or mistakes or, or heavy workloads, what, what have you. Um, and there are some people who are really naturally quite resilient too, right? So it takes a big event to really stress them. And even then people around them, unless they know them well, may not really see it. So, you know, we, it's one of the things we see in all the, the uh, all that's written about the pandemic right now is this big focus on well-being, which is clearly important. It is clearly important at work. Stress and the, the physical ailments, psychological ailments caused by stress are, are uh, take a huge human toll and they take a huge financial toll. Um, and so it's a really important topic, but it's also important to keep in mind, I think, um, and it's why I, I'm glad you mentioned sort of the, the personality components, Blake, um, it's, we have to almost take this on an individual basis because there are differences across people. It's not one size fits all. We certainly need to pay attention to it as organizations, but we also need to think somewhat individualistically about it too, and make sure that we're not trying to treat everyone the same because they're not all the same. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things. And, and I don't know, I'm going to maybe get a little bit off script, you know, <laughs> just talking about um, maybe how personality was affected by the pandemic. I know that we've done some research on that uh, internally. I don't, Scott or Ryan, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but what, what have we seen as far as have we seen our personalities be affected in one way or the other as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it, it is a really interesting question. Scott, I hope you don't mind if I jump in. Please. Um, it's uh, one we get a lot, right? So we, we, this is a very intuitive thing to think, okay, well, there's a pandemic, so people's uh, personalities or their responses to the personality assessments are changing. Um, as you mentioned, Blake, we have done some research on this. We did research really early on, a few months in. Then we also did uh, research as a one-year follow-up. So one year after the pandemic, we looked at scores pre-pandemic, we looked at scores post-pandemic. Um, it's not an ideal study design. An ideal study design, you'd have people measured twice. But um, when you have a large amount of data that we do, and you're looking at all the countries we're looking at, and you see no mean changes across uh, time, uh, it's pretty clear that people really aren't changing their personalities or at least their personality test scores as a result of the pandemic. Now, I think what's really going on is people's attitudes are changing, right? So people are prioritizing different kinds of change in their lives. They're, try they're, they're, they're changing their preferences for certain things. But the sort of um, things that the, the way that they think of themselves on a daily basis, their identities or their, even their reputations really aren't changing that much. So the things that we're, we're measuring with it with a personality assessment aren't changing very much, but certainly there are things about us that are changing, right? So, so I think some people might've concluded we're saying, no, nothing's changed psychologically at all. I don't think that's true. Of course, people have changed quite a bit psychologically. It's just not those personality components. Yeah, there's a great uh, question in the Q&A too that I think is relevant to this, which is about uh, uh, one in particular about boomers and, and leaving the workforce and so forth. And I think you mentioned this, Ryan, but you know, part of what's going on too, even people who are feeling burned out or who not feeling empowered, the question is always, is there something else? that is better, that I, or that is the grass greener somewhere? Do I, at least I believe the grass is greener somewhere? And, um, and we, we see in you know, the increased retirements of people near mm -hmm. retirement age, but not necessarily traditional retirement age even, um, they may be reevaluating and, and, uh, and thinking, yes, there is something better for me and it's not working in the traditional sense anymore because there are new opportunities to do that with remote work and, and so forth, more flexibility and so forth. Yeah, I think that's actually a really great point, Scott. I remember early on in the pandemic when um, you know, people were you know, quitting some jobs. Well, I guess it was right when, I, don't, I forget exactly when this was, it was during one of these waves when people are starting to sort of kind of go back, but not quite go all the way back. And, 
And people were, companies were talking about having trouble filling jobs. And the idea was, well, as more people get comfortable or um, in the United States, they were talking about as stimulus checks, as those stimulus checks run out, people will come back to work. But what we've seen is not really. And I think part of it is that. I think part of it is, you know, uh, well, I to use an N of one anecdote, my mom retired at like 58, right? Or 59, something like that, um, which is, you know, before the typical retirement age, because for the same reason, she just said, hey, look, I've been working the same company for all these years uh, since she was 18, so which is impressive. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and I'm able now to retire and that's what I want to do. That's, uh, you know, I, this is how I want to make my choice now. And so it was really, it was actually pretty clear for some data early on that, I know economists were saying some people are going to come back, but I was like, wait a minute. I don't think these people aren't coming back, right? They're not coming back to work yeah. because they're, they're saying, no, I actively, I don't need to do that now. Um, and, and I'm going to go do something else with my time. Yeah. Well, okay. So we continue to have questions come in through the chat or through the Q and a function. So uh, I actually want to get to some of those now. So for those of you out there, um, Feel free to drop those questions there and we will we'll answer them here in real time and we don't have to wait until the end just to, to answer some of these but this one i think is really interesting uh it comes from an anonymous attendee so uh what are your thoughts on the great regret following resignations you know and it says are there any personality attributes that may help mitigate or predict the shift shock wow that's really interesting I, i'll um I'll make a conjecture about the personality part. I, this is not based on data, so this is just me making this up. Um, but uh, there are individual differences in the speed with which people make decisions and the amount of data with which people make decisions. We've done a lot of research on what we call judgment, but it's really about our biases, personality-based biases in, in decision-making. And I think for some people, whether, whether as a result of, of resigning during the pandemic or, or at any other time, uh, I think there, is a, there are a certain number of people that make a rather impulsive decision or, um, or tend to focus on the upside, uh, naturally tend to have that bias. They look, they look at the bright side. And then once they get into the new job and the new coworkers and so forth, they, they uh, come to the conclusion that uh, these are the same turkeys I was working with before, right? And so there, so there is, uh, I think, sometimes some, some regret simply because of that. It wasn't a thorough decision. It, people let their biases get in front of them and, and made a decision without really thinking it through as carefully as they might have wished that they did. Yeah, I think I think that's part of it. I think the other part is when you see lots of people, right, which we've seen, right? If you think about, you know, Scott mentioned at the outset, we've seen people, the increase in people uh, quitting jobs going up over the last decade. But then there was this pause and this sort of like this um, like buildup, like you think about a hose, right? You, you, you cut the hose, uh, you hold the hose for a little while, and then you let go and there's this huge burst of people quitting jobs. Uh, inevitably, what you're also going to see with that is a bigger chunk of people who regret those decisions as well, because more people made those decisions. So there's going to be more people regretting them as well. Um, you know, I, I think I think for the reasons that, that Scott mentioned, right, there's some impulsivity to it, but also, you know, sometimes uh, a thing, something looks really promising, um, but but uh, it tur turns out not to be to, to not to be so promising. Uh, you know. There's a lot of factors in jobs that we don't think about. I, a couple of things that, 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 I, that I talk to people about all the time is, is don't underestimate the value of your colleagues. Like the value of the people that you work with, liking the people that you work with is really worth a lot in a job. And so it's really tempting to be in a job where you really like the people you work with, but then you hear about some other job that sounds like a good opportunity, maybe it pays more. I mean, you go, I'm going to take it and maybe the people there will be great. But if you get there and the people there aren't fun to work with, they don't really jive with you very well to use the modern lingo, um, uh, then, uh, you know, you might really have some regrets about that, even though uh, objectively speaking, right on paper, it looks like a better job. Um, but I will say one job that I have not seen a single person regret quitting is academic jobs. So there you go. <laughs> 
interesting. Well, <laughs> well, Ryan, thanks for that. Scott, thank you also. And, you know, for me, you know, I, we, I think whenever everything, you know, the pandemic hit and all of that started, you know, honestly, the transition was pretty easy until we started this podcast. And I have this co-host who is really demanding and really high maintenance, but I digress. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just poking a little bit of fun at Ryan. But uh, the next question actually is kind of a question that was posed in the Q&A feature, but is also the next question I was planning to ask in a sense. Um, so now that we have a better understanding of the why regarding the big quit or great resignation or whatever you want to call it, what can organizations do to mitigate it or to retain some of this top talent? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, a couple things I'd say. One is um, we study motivation a lot and we know that personality motivation is related to the kinds of work people choose, the kind of work people like to do, even the kinds of people they like to do it with, uh, to Ryan's point earlier. And so I think one thing that organizations can do, A, is just simply recognize that, that it's, uh, there may not be one thing that they can do. And so thinking sort of systematically about what do different people need, there won't be an infinite list, right? There, you can look at functions even and personality characteristics of people in various functions, uh, occupational interests of people in various functions, and there will be some commonalities for those, you know, across those, uh, those groups of people. And so it may be a different answer for different groups. We tend to see a lot of articles about, um, about you know, having uh, online happy hours. And I think we all got uh, just inundated with those kinds of things, right? When the pandemic and work, remote work came about. Um, you know, extroverts tend to love those, uh, just to put this in a personality context. Extroverts love those because it's an opportunity to interact with people. Introverts, if they're forced to do it, will despise that. It won't be a positive for them. So I do think we have to look at the, the individual differences, but it's not, it's not infinite. You can systematically think about that, even if you just think about people in various functions that you have in your business. But I think the biggest thing that, uh, organizations can do, or maybe two things. One is back to this point about making sure that they have the most effective leaders in place, uh, making sure that they really are defining what effective leadership is. We define that in terms of, of uh, being a resource for the group that is helping to build and sustain a high performing team. So organizations should really pay attention to that. It's something, by the way, if you look at the, the surveys on the biggest concerns for CEOs, really over the past at least 10 years, it's always one of the top ones. They're, they're always concerned about having the best leadership in place. I think it requires a real, uh, really clear focus right now because it matters more than ever with all the stress that people are under and all the changes that people are making. But as a really practical matter, and then I'll turn it back over to Ryan, but as a really practical matter, I think organizations, leaders need to do what we've always said they need to do and what they've always known they need to do, which is really listen to people, pay attention to what people need from them, what the barriers that people are facing are and how they can help remove those barriers from people. And, you know, it sounds really easy. It's incredibly difficult to do well, but I think it is a key part of the answer. It is just really listening, asking the questions and really listening and then trying to do something about what we heard. Yeah, I, I think one of the sort of themes that we saw at least um, some of the time or early on through this quote unquote, great resignation was this notion that, oh, people don't want to work. People don't want to work anymore. But actually, it seems like the survey data suggests that, no, that people do want to work, that they actually, you know, people do want to work. They want, they want to be uh, employed somewhere. Um, but what they want to do is they want to work in an environment where they feel their contributions matter, where they feel valued, where they feel empowered to make decisions, where they um, uh, can, can have an impact and, and know that, that the work that they're doing matters for something. And so um, 
you know, I, on, on that front, I think that that's one of the things that employers can do is try to create, you know, make sure that people understand that they're valued, make sure people understand um, that their contributions matter to the workplace. And so, uh, and I think, again, Scott, this goes back to your point about the leadership uh, of an organization uh, has a big impact. Look, uh, people have choices now that they didn't have before. And, and I know we mentioned right. this at the outset as well. Um, when there's more available jobs out there than there were before, uh, you know, you, there's a competition from the employer's point of view. What are, what are the things you're going to offer? Um, you know, I know one of the questions we get a lot is about um, remote work and how to deal with remote work, how to handle remote work. Uh, uh, it seems uh, pretty apparent that uh, in jobs where remote work could be an option, right? Um, we've talked uh, in, in previous discussions about you know, police officers and firefighters and how, okay, you can't really do those remotely. Uh, but in, in, in there, by the way, there are a whole lot of jobs. I mean, it's easy for me to talk about remote work sitting, you know, uh, in my own home. Um, but um, so there's a whole lot of jobs where you can't do remotely. But for those of us who can, for those jobs where they can be done remotely, that it seems to be a significant factor in whether people will stay at a job or look for a new job. And, and Scott, I would I suppose, I, I'm betting you have some comments on that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's true. And it, um, you know, to your point about uh, meaning too, it's mm -hmm. one of the things that we have found in our research and, and others have for, for decades is that people really want a sense of vision from their leaders. They, mm -hmm. they want leaders, and I don't mean this in a big this sort of highfalutin charismatic way, they, they want to know why they're doing what they're doing and why this matters. And I think, you know, we're in this situation where we're we're all worried about the health of our friends and families, and and we're changing all the way we do work and all these things. Um, people tend to reflect on these things. You know, am I doing something that matters? Am I doing something that's meaningful? And it is one of the, I think, the great tasks of, of leadership to to try to help people understand what that is, what that purpose is that uh, that's that's bigger than all of us that we're all that we're all striving for. Um, and and then there, you know, there are just a few other fundamental things that people want from their leaders, honesty being one of those. <laughs> I, I, I want to be able to trust this person. Um, and uh, and I want them to know something about the business and lead by example and, and you know and, and really help me solve problems and I you know it's some some sort of fundamental things that we we can forget but I think it's a good time to be reminded of those uh, and organizations who do emphasize those things I think do better. So another question from our audience that I'm 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 interested to, to ask you all is. Um, it, it's how we think the focus on equity for diverse audiences, whether it be gender, ethnicity, et cetera, magnified by the George Floyd tragedy has impacted the resignation. Are there any trends for resignations for women, black or other underrepresented audiences? I mean, and coming from someone who's a, you know, as a Native American of Cherokee descent, you know, that's another underrepresented one that we've, you know, we've seen some traction in, you know, pop culture from that perspective, but not necessarily in workplace culture, but have we seen any trends in, in those areas? I think, unfortunately, the, the trend is the, the groups you mentioned, that is uh, women and ethnic minorities have been hit hardest um, for a variety of reasons. I think women because of, uh, really because of sort of traditional roles in caregiving, whether that's extended family or its children or, or whatever. I mean, we've certainly lots of stats out there about women leaving the workforce in, in, in larger numbers because they're taking on more uh, caregiving responsibilities. Um, and so there has to be a trade-off there. So I think, I mean, and that's, uh, that's tragic. And I think it's something that companies need to, I don't know that anybody's got a great answer to it, but I think companies need to really focus on trying to find some answers that provide more flexibility uh, because I think we've lost a lot of the gains in, in diversity that we, that we had once. And I think, you know, for, for underrepresented groups, um, 
particularly, you know, Ryan mentioned that there are a number of occupations that simply cannot be done remotely, that simply do not have the level of flexibility that, that we do in our roles. And um, that, that throughout the pandemic had to show up, had to be there in person. Um, and traditionally they were also very low wage jobs. And so we're seeing now a lot of price competition for those workers, uh, they, they can get better opportunities, uh, at least financially, by moving across companies. And I think there's a real war for talent there. Um, but what, so, and companies are competing on price, I think a lot of the time, uh, but I think uh, that's kind of short-sighted because I think companies need to really think about how do we improve the quality, even for those roles that inherently don't have a lot of flexibility in how they're done or where they're done, how can we enhance the quality of the, of the work life, the work environment for those people beyond paying them more, which certainly is one step of progress down the path, but there's a lot more to it, I think. Yeah, and on that, on both of those points, the, the, the articles that I linked earlier in the chat, uh, you know, the first one does talk about how the, the sort of big quit does seem to vary based on uh, industry, in particular, uh, retail industries, uh, restaurant industry, uh, you know, fast food, those kinds of places have been hit pretty hard because I think for the reasons you just described, Scott. Um, but it also talks about, actually, in the second article, it talks about what does it really mean uh, when we talk about a toxic workplace, right? So we know that tox workplace toxicity is, is one, of, one of those leading drivers. And it, there's actually a nice chart in the second article that talks about sort of the five um, aspects of toxicity or five factors that, that are included in toxicity. Um, and the first one is, is just being disrespectful, um, having lack of consideration for others. Um, and, and so I, I think that one's uh, uh, probably not news. But what's really interesting is that right on its heels in terms of um, having an impact on, uh, on, on, on people wanting to quit their jobs, or at least in this case, quitting their jobs and giving negative glass door reviews, uh, has to do with non-inclusivity. So this includes um, inclusivity around all kinds of areas, LGBTQ, disability, race, age, uh, gender. Um, and so I, I think that's absolutely uh, one of the issues. And one of the things that organizations can do, and again, look, we know there's some jobs that it, it's, it can't be done remotely. And, and to your point earlier about um, you know, inequities, particularly for women who, look, when schools shut down, like that's a big factor, right? When schools shut down, kids have to go somewhere. Daycare shut down, kids have to go somewhere. So when, when, when you're in, in households where uh, both parents or both of the couple are, are working, one person has to, has to uh, in, in many cases, had to sacrifice for that. And in many cases, for traditional reasons, it was women who, who made that sacrifice. Um, so to me, that says one really obvious thing workplaces can do is we can take jobs that can be done remotely and we can give people those flexible options because that actually allows um, both men and women to share in that, that, that child that child care part, right? So mm -hmm. um, because I can work from home, for example, and by the way, and this is a totally a personal example, the elementary school is a three minute walk from my house, right? So uh, in here in about 20 minutes, my kids are gonna come home and if my wife needs me to do something with them, I can, you know, my kids are old enough that they can mostly take care of themselves. So, but I can do something, right? And then she can do what she needs to do. We can both work without, uh, without having to juggle that. And so and that's, an, you know, okay. So thanks Scott for, uh, you know, <laughs> letting, letting me work remotely to, to make this work. But that's something that organizations can do um, to, to uh, reduce that, in, that, reduce that inequity. Yeah. Okay, so for my next question, uh, and this will be the, the last one before we, we dive into the, the full Q&A here at the end. Um, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, or recently about like how organizations can retain top talent. Um, but, you know, that's, yeah, sure. That's what our audience is here to do. A lot of our audience is HR practitioners or talent acquisition specialists, you know, CHROs. Um, they're worried about retaining top talent, but also, you know, they might be in a position where they kind of feel um, as if maybe maybe they need to 
also reconsider, you know, where they're working or, you know, what their career is looking like. So I'd like to focus on the individual with this last question, because ultimately that's the most important element when it comes to retaining top talent. So what can people do as individuals to find meaning in their work? Yeah, well, um, you know, we at Hogan, we've been studying motivation uh, for over 30 years. And um, I mentioned before that there are, we know lots of, of things about uh, how people make decisions about their work, about how personality characteristics and interests and motivators align with different kinds of work. So at the individual level, I think, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of reflection as a, as a development tool for, for everyone uh, that is stepping back and taking the time to really think through what's important to me, what do I enjoy doing, what's difficult for me, uh, you know, where do I need to improve, all those things. But I think at the individual level, gaining some systematic insight into where you find meaning, what is most motivating to you can really be helpful to, and, and also help people avoid this, uh, the sort of bias, grass is always greener decisions that, uh, that sometimes get made. So I think being really intentional about ensuring the match. Um, and there's actually a lot of written about this uh, in terms of interviewees. How do you interview a company to make sure that their culture will match what, what's important to you? It's a really important issue. And, and we know a lot about this in psychology. I mean, this, uh, and Ryan can say more about this because he studied a lot, but there's a lot, there's big literature on um, occupational interests and how they influence over the course of our careers, the kinds of choices we make, if we're deliberate and thoughtful about doing that. And, and people who are, people who tend to have better matches are more satisfied. They tend to stay longer. They tend to work in, in sort of similar kinds of jobs over time because they get the fulfillment that they really need from those jobs. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, there's actually a really large literature on uh, occupational preferences um, and personality and motivation and individual differences and how those things all line up. Um, one of the things that, that shows up in that literature has to do with cultural differences. We know that um, in sort of more egalitarian uh, cultures where people have more freedom of choice about what career they might wanna pursue, uh, those interests really line up really well. People who have stronger interests in things end up going for the careers that actually fit through. So they stay in them longer, they're happier. Uh, that, that seems to work better for those individuals. Whereas in other countries, or I say countries, but it could be territories, it could be, it could be even in regions within a country where um, uh, there, there's less freedom, right? Uh, it could be for financial reasons, economic reasons, political reasons, but where there's less freedom to um, sort of pursue the career that you really want to, to pursue a career that matches with your interests. And we do see that people are um, more miserable, um, more likely to switch careers if they can, right? If they can, but also into another, you know, more one that they don't really like, right? So, um, so I think that's a really big part of, of finding that meaning in work is finding something that, that really matches with your interests. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that that starts with a, with a good assessment. <laughs> Good pitch. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll also add, this is, this is a place where companies can help people too. If you think about, um, uh, you know, a lot of companies are, are doing stay interviews. They're, they're really thinking about how can we make sure that people are finding meaning, they are uh, finding satisfaction and engagement here. Well, one way to do that is to, to, to be data rational about it. And, um, you know, we see an example, and this is not a new example, but we see an example where this falls apart often in organizations uh, where they have a really great performing individual contributors, you know, technical expert, and they promote that because that person is really successful and thought of highly, they promote that person into a supervisory or people management role. And, it, and that may in fact not be something that is engaging for that person. Uh, it may have been about the content of that individual work uh, that, that was so, so satisfying for them. So, you know, sometimes that happens uh, and, uh, and when it happens, you decrease somebody's motivation and you fill a role with somebody who's not going to be as effective as you need them to be. So it's a lose-lose. So I think on the one hand, 
individuals can be through, particularly through assessment, get better sort of clear insights about what is most motivating for them in a way that will help them reflect on it. But companies can use the same kind of data to think about where's the best match for this person? What are the best kinds of opportunities I should be offering to this person? Well, Scott, Ryan, thanks. This was this has been an awesome discussion. Um, but now let's take some questions from the audience. I know we've taken a few already, but uh, there's definitely plenty here. So we'll, we'll take a few of them before we, we wrap this thing up. So the first one, uh, this one actually comes from Barrett. And I'll try to sum this up a little bit. But uh, Barrett says that you know his company is struggling um, with company culture um, because most of the team is now remote and they're a smaller company. Um, and whenever they were in the office, they were doing food days and, you know, more in-person activities, but now that they're remote, um, you know, they, they haven't had very many raises since the pandemic started. Uh, they have some financial limitations and they're just, what are some ways that a company in a situation like this, cause there are a lot of them out there, um, mm -hmm. to kind of retain that talent and also enhance the culture at a time when it's maybe not as easy as it was whenever they were in person? Well, it's a, it's a really difficult question and it's, it's not only small companies that are dealing with that question. I think it's, a, it's almost universal right now. Um, I think, you know, two things I would offer. One of those is um, I think flexibility is, is important and in some ways is going to be the new norm. And when I say flexibility, I mean things about uh, offering various kinds of ways for people to connect, being, being deliberate in the design of how we structure our work days, how we structure meetings. Um, for example, even saying, okay, we have these regular meetings uh, that are focused on a certain number of topics, uh, but we're always going to take five minutes and just chat. And leaders have to take the lead, and <laughs> no pun intended, but they have to take the lead in that to share, you know, let's talk today about, you know, something interesting I did yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. just to try to get something going. Now, some people will find that really boring and unnatural, and uh, you have to allow for that too. So when I say flexibility, that's, I really mean it all encompassing. Um, but I think we have to be more deliberate about allowing the opportunities for people to interact differently than they would have. And we're all, I think, still trying to figure this out right now. But I also think this notion of purpose, really honing, out, honing in on purpose and trying to understand from the employee's perspective, why do they wanna be here? Why do they stay here? Uh, helping them to sort of paint that picture of purpose for each other can be really helpful too. Yeah, and I, I think to that, the, the first point you made there, Scott, um, I read an article the other day that suggested that a sizable chunk of time that people spent in the office, when, when people were in the office, was actually not doing formal discussion, right? And one of the things that I think has happened since since people have gone to remote situations like the one that Barrett described is that everything's become very formal. Everything's become very structured. We have these meetings, we talk, we, we cover the issues in the meeting, we get out of here. We do. And um, it is hard to maintain a culture. It's hard to maintain that sense of connection when you do that. So I think you're absolutely right. It starts with the leaders. It starts with encouraging people just to say, hey, we, we don't have to spend every waking moment of this meeting covering you know the, the details of this project right we can spend a few and guess what you've got chat functions with each other you can talk about things that are going on in your lives in the chat function it is okay to spend some of your work time talking about real life personal issues or to just making a fun and friendly conversation with your colleagues just like you would in the office if you were in the office you would be having those kinds of conversations about the, the basketball team score or the the local school board election or whatever it is, those kinds of conversations you would be having um, with, your, with your colleagues. And I think it's important to maintain those. And I think a lot of organizations have lost those since we, we went away. You've, you've lost yeah. connections with other people that you saw every day. Um, it's okay to have, I, I think, and again, it starts with the leaders saying, guys, it's okay 
to talk about these things and to use company chat to do that. Yeah, and I think another a point, you know, just something specific, an example of what, you know, we've done at Hogan is we have these periodic uh, uh, meetings where it's, you know, anybody in the company, everybody in the company is invited to participate. And then we all um, get on a call for 30 minutes and we do like a morning session and an, uh, an afternoon session because we have to accommodate different time zones with some of our, our uh, people that we work with. But we don't get on with any agenda or anything. We just get on to talk about things. And Scott, I think you've attended almost all of them pretty much. I tried to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a good way for, for new employees who maybe have never even met people in person because they've come on since the pandemic started. Right. It, it's a way for them to get to, to meet the CEO and talk to him and realize, oh, wow, Scott is an incredible drummer. <laughs> you know, that something a lot of people don't know. I know, Scott, sorry to... Sorry to throw that out there and share your secret, but you know things like that. I think bring a lot of value, uh, particularly whenever you are separated and you don't have that inter in office interaction anymore. Uh, it looks like we have about time for one more question, and this is one that um, I, I wanted to ask: is regarding values and preferences, like are they changing now that we're kind of going or becoming more elevated now that we're kind of transitioning from the pandemic phase to the endemic phase? Um, have, have we noticed any kind of changes in values at all? Well, Brian, I, I know I, your from, team did some really great research on this, so go for it. Well, from a statistical perspective, in terms of like the values that we measure at Hogan, the answer is mostly no, right? So I think the biggest change in values was um, on science. We actually saw a slight increase in science with the pandemic by about 0 0.08 standard deviation. So this is really actually pretty tiny. Um, it's small enough that like, for example, if we were hiring people from different um, groups, different group categories, and one had a 0 0.08 standard deviation advantage, we would say this is not, this is not a, a meaningful difference in terms of those group differences. Um, this could be statistically um, equally likely for, for any reason. Um, however, uh, from a non sort of statistical, non sort of uh, measuring Hogan values perspective, right? So if we're thinking about what do people think about, I, I think I mentioned earlier attitudes, if we're thinking about what, what people are thinking about in their lives. Uh, there absolutely have, have been some changes here. Uh, look, I think about the situation, and I was just speaking with a woman um, yesterday from Poland. Uh, you know, think about the situation if you're living in Poland um, a, a year, two years ago, it was people stay away. I need to keep my distance from everybody, right? And now there's this flood of people coming in and there's really this value for, um, uh, for, for altruism, really. Again, statistically, if like our measure of altruism, the scores aren't changing, but in terms of the, these sorts of behaviors we're seeing, reaching out, inviting people into your homes, uh, taking care of people, right? Strangers, right? Bringing people and getting closer to people, becoming more connected with people, uh, there is some pendulum swing on that. And, and so uh, I think there absolutely is that sort of um, attitudinal change uh, ha has happened. But, but again, in terms of like a long-term personality or long-term, um, you know, what's my philosophy of life or how do I think people should live their lives? We're not seeing changes there, but we are seeing changes in, in, in how people are, are um, acting on a day-to-day on a -day basis. Well, okay. I said that was the last question, but there was one that was in the Q&A feature that disappeared randomly, but this is a yes or no question for Scott. It asked, are you high affiliation slash hedonism? <laughs> yes, I, I answered that in the chat and the answer oh, is did. yes. It was, uh, whoever, whoever does that gets the, the Hogan prize today for correctly uh, guessing. <laughs> Well, I think those, those are two, two values that, that Scott, Ryan, and I all share. So, uh, well, thank you, Scott and Ryan, and thank, thank you to all of our guests uh, for joining us for this first edition of the Science of Personality Live. Uh, we'd love to connect with all of you on our social media channels. So you can follow Hogan on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to stay up to date with all the exciting things that we're doing. Also, if you're not already one of our loyal listeners of the Science of Personality podcast, be sure to check out our full library of episodes at thescienceofpersonality.com and be on the lookout for a new episode every other Tuesday. Cheers, everybody.
Thanks, guys.